what's up everybody? This is Maggie Reichardt and you are listening to Nursing Uncharted, the podcast that talks about all the different ways that we can use this license while having some conversations about nursing um, in between. Welcome to season one of 2023. We had one season, we had one episode um, before this with Andrea Dalzell, but we had recorded that before I went on maternity leave. So this is the first episode um, after my daughter Valerie was born. So I'm super excited to get started into this season. And one other thing that happened um, between now and then is that we got a thousand subscribers on our YouTube channel, which is incredible and super excited um, to see the next thousand go on there. So if you haven't subscribed to our YouTube channel, please do that. And we also are on Instagram at Nursing Uncharted. Um, so yeah, if you have any episodes that you want to hear about this season, I would love to figure out, you know, what we want to talk about this season and, and titrate that based on what you guys want to hear. So I had somebody come tell me that they would love to have a wound nurse on. I would love to have a wound nurse on. And also if you know anybody that could be like a great, um, person to have on the podcast, I would love to get shout outs from that as well. So today, um, I wanted to talk about a realm of nursing that, you know, I just recently had experience with, and that is mother baby nursing. And I found a nurse that is kind of threefold. She's a travel nurse, she's a mother baby nurse, and she also works in an IV bar. Um, so we have tons of things to talk about. So today, um, I'm sitting down with Gabby Williams. Gabby obtained her associate's degree in May of 2021, and she started her nursing career in mother baby. She's also a trained birth doula with her own business called Merry Little Lambs. She's in the middle of completing her BSN at James Madison University, and she will be graduating in a few months. She has always had a passion for caring for women and children and has a long-term goal of becoming a certified nurse midwife. So Gabby, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for having me. I'm so excited. Yeah, I'm really excited to have you on too. I wanted to cover this while, you know, Mother Baby was kind of fresh in my mind. Right. Yeah. So what led you to Mother Baby in the first place? Let me talk about your, what has, you know, your career looked like so far? Yeah. So initially I've always wanted to be a nurse. Like when I was younger for elementary school, like career day, my mom would come, she would talk to the class. Your mom's a nurse? Um, yeah, my mom is a nurse. So okay. that's where my initial passion came from. But you notice sometimes in the health profession, some people are nurses for the wrong reasons. So you can't mm-hmm. want to be a nurse just because your mom or someone influential was a nurse. Yeah. So I had to develop my own passion. So I wasn't really able to do anything. Um, At that young age. And so finally, I when I was maybe in middle school, I did a volunteer experience at the um, at the Children's Hospital of Richmond. And I didn't have any licensure or any like kind of certifications. You had to go through a training, but it just made me value my health. And that's where I then developed my own passion for nursing. So I was like, okay, that I definitely want to be a nurse. And then I went on to high school to pursue my certified nursing assistant. And I was like, of course, I don't want to stop here. So then I kept on going. I knew I loved caring for people, but I knew that the population that I wanted to care for consisted of women and children. So Mm -hmm. I I had narrowed it down to like even before I actually started nursing school, I was like, I want to do a labor and delivery or a mother baby or a NICU or peas or PICU. Only those. Nothing else. You knew. Yeah. So so I knew like right away before I even experienced it. Mm hmm. So then it, it's not easy. Mother, baby, between mother, baby and labor and delivery, they are pretty popular jobs within the nursing scope, especially yeah. when you are a new nurse. So you're competing up against mm-hmm. people who have experience within the field. So it was pretty tough, but I stuck beside it. Um, a lot of the times when you're a new nurse, you tend to just gravitate towards any job. Mm-hmm. Um because you're excited to become a nurse. Um, and that's what however, people tell you to do, too. Yeah, you know, but I would to... not recommend it because you want to be happy. Sometimes people are like, well, you only work in a profession for 
you gain this experience in med surge, which is typically what people say, mm -hmm. and then you leave after a year. However, your your patients can feel your unhappiness, and nobody wants mm -hmm. like when you're in the hospital, you're already sick for the most part. Um, not of course not on mother and infant. That's just not necessarily. So yeah. you want someone that's happy, and you can like feel that they don't want to be there. So I would never recommend that to anyone. Mm -hmm. So I knew that I didn't want to do that, especially because I also had experience as a CNA working on med surge. It did. Mm -hmm. it, it set a strong foundation. So a lot of my skills I learned, it did come from um, med surge actually. But I was like, yeah. I just refuse to be unhappy within a field that I know I don't desire to work in. Yeah. So I had to work a little harder than my peers. You know, it wasn't always easy to see the positivity in things. I was graduating nursing mm -hmm. school. Everybody was getting jobs. I graduated in May. Mm -hmm. I didn't start working until September. Oh, yeah. I knew many different nursing connections. And I felt bad because at times I would be like, oh, my gosh, I'm never going to get a job. And it would be people like, I can get you a job and cardiac med surge. And I was like, no thanks. Stay in the course. I had to stay the course. So I was strong on what I believed in. Um, so any of my nursing students out there or aspiring nurses, stick with it. So I applied, mm -hmm. but not only did I apply, I reached out in a professional mannerism and I would just express my interest to the nurse managers. And sometimes that's not always easy, but I was al already working within the health system that I desired to work in as a mm -hmm. nurse. So it kind of gave me a stepping stone. So I would reach out to them or I would call, leave professional voicemails, ask for shadowing experience. So all of that stuff counts. It shows yeah. you're an interested candidate. So I had to do that. Absolutely. I um I was having a hard time getting the job and then finally I got an offer for Pete, but I had also already applied for Mother Infant. So I was a little hesitant on accepting. And my mom was like, You've been waiting on this, but I was like, No, I have a good feeling. And thankfully I waited because Three days later, that Friday, I got the offer for Mother Infant. And then that following week, I had an upcoming interview with Pick You and Nick You. So I just say all that to say, keep the faith alive and yeah. always think positive. You know, I actually, um, I know a couple nursing students that had graduated in this past May, and they were waiting to take their NCLEX for Month. Like, I don't know what was going on with the Virginia Board of Nursing, but like really? they couldn't get they they couldn't get their slot. You know how like oh my they gosh. have to like call it call or wh what did we get? Like, like a, you go online or something and do a link now that or nursing students help us out. <laughs> you would get oh, like a right. uh, piece of mail or something to say like, you know, you have a, a time slot or you have like a number or code. And then that would like allow you to register for your NCLEX or something like that. And there's like a good chunk of new nursing, like newly graduated BSN nurses. They couldn't like come to the bedside. I was just like you having to wait to get to the bedside just like made me think of that because yeah, a that's... lot of nurses had to wait like five, six months. Anyway. Oh my gosh. I didn't yeah. even know that was a thing. I know. I let me see. I graduated in May, March, and I tested in June. Yeah. I didn't want to wait too long. I was like, oh my much... gosh, I can't believe they had to wait that long. I know. I'm like, we ha there is a shortage here. Like, board of right. nursing, <laughs> what are you doing? We got to get the ball rolling. I know. Oh. So, That's... did you all, so was mother baby your choice number one, or did you want to do like Nick, you pick you? Honestly, my number one, I thought, was labor and delivery. Mm. And I thought labor and mother infant was number two, but my clinical experience wasn't so great. So I, I couldn't really tell. It's kind of hard to tell. And mm -hmm. when I was in nursing school, I didn't get to go in the picky. I don't think students get to, I don't know. A it's lot more of generalized. Times, yeah. I mean, so like I you said, it's hard with a specialty. It's hard to get your foot in the door as a nursing student. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I didn't get a PICU clinical or a NICU clinical. So it's kind of like you have no idea. Yeah. It's so funny that you asked that because I had a friend who got a job in the NICU and, you know, she thought she would love it, love it, but it just wasn't a good fit for her. But it's kind of mm -hmm. it's kind of sad because you don't know until you actually start working there. Even yeah. from a shadow experience, you don't really get much if you shadow for a couple of hours. It's hard to tell. Right. It's hard. Well, it's certainly hard to get a feel of any kind of unit when you don't have like you don't know the culture. You don't know like the people you're working with. It's hard. It's a gamble. 
But also, yeah, like when you have never had any nursing experience and then you're not, you know, offered those opportunities to shadow in ICUs, it's like, you know, right. if that's what you want to do, but then you might not actually want to do that. Yeah. And it's hard also, like, to this day, I, I love the I love you students because I was once a student and I'm still a student since I'm completing my BSN right mm-hmm. now. But you don't you don't know how it feels until you're a nurse. But I always keep in the back of my mind. I was just a student not too long ago, but sometimes it can be rough having a student. But I would never, ever, ever make my student feel like um, their presence is not wanted. Yeah. And I had a rough time. I had kind of a negative experience going through clinicals. And so, you know, it kind of set the basis for like, oh, I don't want to work within this specialty. But of course, it could be hospital dependent. Sure. Yeah. yeah absolutely. So it's, it's rough. I think that's important for I I am the same with you. I I feel like I'm always when I have a student, I really try to be patient and take my time with them. Even though like some yeah, it can get hectic and like you want to be a good you want to teach have ample time to teach them like basic concepts, but then you're also like when you go into a shift during the day, it's not like, okay, I'm going to have a student. Let me get this assignment. Like a lot of times it's, right. you're just given whatever you're given. If it's going to be a crazy day, you just have somebody extra. Yeah. And it could be hard. Cause it's like, well, you're a nurse. You're like, oh my God, when well, you're a nursing student, you look at it from two different aspects. And I always try to look at it from both sides of the fence, but it's like, oh my gosh, like, why are the nurses? So, but it's like, before you can even clock in, you're being told you have a student, but they're just there trying to get the learning experience, trying to get right. the hours so they can sit for boards just as we did a few years ago. But yeah, it can be hard and it kind of it slows down your pace because you, yeah. you kind of want to explain to them, but it slows down your pace. And it's kind of hard if you have like continuity of care and you've been in there for the past three days. So you've had these patients. So you really like keep the ball rolling. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, that and oh, I lost my train of thought. What was I going to say? You want to, oh, it's that it does slow you down because you want to take that extra time to educate. And I think there's a misconception there that maybe because you have an extra person, you like, you know, an extra person to like turn or do baths and stuff that it would be easier. But it's not. It's not that you have like an, you know, like you do slow down and you're like teaching somebody how to do those things, how to turn, how to do a bath. And so like it, you know, so in that respect, a lot of times I think like when people are making assignments or like just assigning you with students, that's not, you don't, they don't take that into account. Right. Yeah. So yeah, it could be hard. It can be hard, but. I mean, we have to teach. We have to be patient. We have to teach. We have to in teach order to get- and have like, you know, <laughs> be nice. Right. In order to get new nurses, students. they yeah. have to get their hours. So, yeah, you know, mm-hmm. it's like you just welcome them. But sometimes like you literally just don't know. So like at my facility, I think it's like we have students on Monday too. So say if you work three days in a row, you might have students three days in a row. So it could be kind of draining. Yeah. And some days we even have the point to where some students, like, they don't do full 12. So you might have, like, I've had scenarios where I've had one student for the half of the day, and it's like, time I get used to them, we get acquainted with one another, they're leaving, and I'm getting new students. So mm-hmm. it's just, but keep doing well, striving students, and all nurses are not as friendly as uh, as all. Yeah. So just, you know, stay strong. Brush it off. Get that learning experience. <laughs> That's, you're there for your learning experience. Yeah. So, I know. Well, about mother baby. So I want to kind of like we set up our episodes talking about logistics of the job. So kind of walk me through what a day in the life looks like for mother baby. Okay. So I love that. A day in the life as a mother baby nurse. So of course you get report. Um, Sometimes I try to look up stuff on my own because you cannot always depend on another nurse to give you everything. Like, Mm -hmm. It's not their fault necessarily if you miss something because you should kind of check, which I can do a better job of doing that. So I try to, you know, of course, get my get report. I sit down and try to, like, take a a small glimpse into their chart because, like, sometimes you Mm -hmm. may be told the patient doesn't have allergies and they actually do. Mm -hmm. So just small stuff like that. 
Um, so I sit down, look at that, assign myself to the patients in the system so that if the doctors or anyone on the care team is trying to look for who the nurse is, they're not sending a message to the nurse from last night, which is the mm-hmm. most important thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I always like to get water, ice water on my <laughs> patients. I go, I cluster my care. So You like, get they, yourself water or you get your patients water? No, my patients, my patients. Okay. <laughs> I mean, both. Both are important. I mean, I give myself water after I uh, (laughs) see my patients. But so I like to start off with giving my patients fresh ice water. If it's time for them to have pain meds, I'll go ahead and bring it, regardless of if I think they will want it or not, or if the night nurse said they didn't take any of their meds. I'll just go with their meds. Worst case Mm -hmm. scenario, if they don't want it, I'll put it back. So I just like to have everything. So I'll go in the room, introduce myself to my patient, try to update the whiteboard. We do not so well about that, but because it's hard for, especially new mamas, you're tired. Yeah. So it's hard for you to remember yeah. my name. <laughs> and <then> sometimes <laughs> they feel bad. And I'm like, please don't feel bad. Yeah. So I'll update the whiteboard, introduce myself to my patient and let them know how long I'll be there, which is important to me because I don't like in my, like, so say if it's a day where I'm not working a 12 hour shift and I'm only working four hours or I'm only working eight hours, I always say, hello, I'm Gabby. I'll be you and your baby's nurse for the day until three. Or until seven. Mm -hmm. So that sometimes, so if the day gets crazy and we do shift change and they're like, well, dang, where happened to my nurse? She didn't even say goodbye. Yeah. So it's kind of like have (laughs) that idea, especially like when you develop a good relationship with their, with your patients. So they're not like shocked that you, you're leaving them or they expected you to be there all day because typically you work 12 hours. Um, So then I'll get a set of vitals on my mom. I'll assess her bleeding, ask her how her bleeding is doing. We'll talk about how feeding is going and mm. all of the education. Even if the nurse before me says she did that education, I always start off doing my education. What kind of education is involved? Yep. So I ask, how's, ble- how's your bleeding doing? For, so for a postpartum mom, they should not be bleeding. They should not be saturating the pad in less than an hour. If they do, mm. that raises a little concern about hemorrhaging maybe. Mm. Um and then I also educate them that they may pass blood clots, which is normal. However, they should not be larger than an egg or a golf ball, mm-hmm. which some, which is kind of like a fine line. So I always say if you pass a blood clot and you're unsure, just call me and I can come look at it. Keep yeah. In the toilet. And so, I think and that it, I think I, that happened to me. I was like, is this a golf ball? Right. <laughs> like, is this, is this, is this a ping is pong ball? Normal? Like a <laughs> yeah. tennis ball? Which one is it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we do that education just so they know it's okay. Like, I never want my patient to think, well, I don't know. And it could be that it's not a normal clot, a normal size mm-hmm. clot, and they think it's normal. So we just develop yeah. that relationship right off the bat. Mm-hmm. Um, if they're a fresh um, mom, so a fresh C-section or a vaginal delivery, we like to get two measure voids. And so mm-hmm. if we don't have that, I just give them a friendly reminder and educate them. You know, we have the, your, the hat in the restroom, and I just want you to get up and pee. Mm-hmm. Or... If they haven't gotten up yet and say they had a vaginal delivery and their status post epidural, I always tell them to call me the first time you mm-hmm. get up or the fir- the sure. couple, the first couple of times just for safety reasons. Yeah. Um, I'll go over safe sleep, which is very, very important because as a new mom, you're tired. So I always mm-hmm. say you can always cuddle with your baby. However, if you get sleepy, Mom and dad or whoever the partner is, you need to switch off or put the baby in the bassinet. A lot of people think, oh, because I'm a light sleeper, it's okay. So I always throw that in there. Even if you feel like you sleep light, it's not mm-hmm. safe. Yeah. Um, and it's like just important to call. I mean, I've found in my experience, it's important to call the nurse. Like there's so many things that you can't do that you don't like think about that you can't do. Right. Like even just the ab strength to like sit yourself up in bed while you're having a, a holding a baby is hard yeah, and it's, it's hard what? for vaginals and c-sections and so like i remember just like sitting up to put my baby in the bassinet i'm like i need help <laughs> you're like this is rough <laughs> like i'm like this is humbling <laughs> yeah so um i also educate them on feeding because a lot of people so what is obvious to me is I don't have any babies of my own yet, but as a mother infant nurse, some things that are obvious to me because I've been doing this. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm experienced with children may not be obvious to a first time mom or even a mom who has three kids and say yeah. she's starting over. She has an 18 year old and things have changed significantly um, since 18 years ago. So I 
I try to keep it the same all across the border. Some moms laugh because they're like, ah, you know, like I got this down pack. But we go over education. Like to feed is very important to feed your baby every three hours and not to exceed three hours um, when you have a mm-hmm. newborn. Mm-hmm. And then I also tell them it's normal that your baby is sleeping like that. And it's hard to wake your baby up to eat. It's a baby. They will sleep all day if you let them. But you got to wake them up and ruffle their feathers so they can eat. Um, yeah, especially in that like first couple of days, right? Like they yeah. sleep. I mean, th- that was a traumatic day for everybody involved. So like right. they want to the ba- sleep. Mama work, you work, the baby work, <laughs> everybody did work. Dad yeah. did work, whether people <laughs> realize it or not. Everybody plays a role. And everyone's tired. Mm -hmm. Um, So we go over that. And then I also go over cluster feeding because I say the education piece that I just said, which was every every baby should be eating every three hours. However, I clarify, it doesn't mean you can't feed your baby Mm -hmm. if you just fed your baby because you could have some babies cluster feed. Mm -hmm. And so you could have just fed your baby an hour ago and your baby's fussing and you've done everything. You can't figure out what's wrong. Whether your baby's showing those signs of hunger, which includes smacking lips, sticking tongue out, rooting towards the breast or putting his or her hands in his mouth. That's them telling you, mommy, I'm hungry. Mm-hmm. So we go over that. Like you may go through a period of cluster feeding. It won't last forever, but it, it may be a thing. Yeah, I heard. So another thing that I learned, like your your breast milk doesn't immediately come in. Like it will take a few days. Right. For some people. And so like they are hungry for days. Yeah. <laughs> and like you have colostrum, which is like, you know, this like golden magic yes. that comes out. That's like a, a small, small amounts. It's supposed to like hold them over for days before your milk comes in. But like it will it can take a few days and like they could cluster feed like crazy. Yeah. It could take up to 72 hours for a month, typically, that's the rough estimate, for Mm -hmm. a mother's milk to mature from collage, to transition from collage from to mature milk. Mm -hmm. Now, I've taken care of some moms that say, like, they've had experience because they have children. They they know that their milk may come in a little later than others or moms had breast reduction or any breast work done. Mm -hmm. So that's not the set standard. Okay. So we do that education. Also, I really like to get into my education. Yeah, I always make sure moms and dads, both or the care um, person, they know how to use the bulb suction because some babies can be spitty yeah. from the am- amniotic fluid. And that can be a very scary experience, especially if you feel helpless, like you don't even know anything to do. Yeah. So we start there. I'm like, do you know how to use it? And some may say yes, some may say no. And we'll go over that education on how mm-hmm. to use it. So after all the education p- parts are done, um, I'll literally go head to toe. It's not as detailed as the one you do in nursing school because it's more of a focused assessment. Sure. So it's not like neuro where I'm asking, like in nursing school where I'm asking, who's the president today? Because it's a mother, mother, infant patient. Yeah. Right. So I will ask mom, is she passing gas? Also, um, because a lot of people have the misconception that you have to have a bowel movement before leaving the hospital. Which mm-hmm. it used to be like that years ago, I think, before I even got into nursing. Now, yeah. it's as long as you're passing gas. And I always tell people it's totally normal to not have a bowel movement before leaving the hospital, which is another important portion. Yeah. Because some people get really concerned or yeah. like they're um, forcing themselves to have a bowel movement. And you really don't want to do that for various reasons. Like if you had stitching um, mm-hmm. on the perineum or your incision is just uncomfortable. And I always say don't strain. Yeah. Uh, we can always give you like a stool softener or some additional assistance, mm-hmm. but this is normal. And well, people need that reassurance. When you think about like your body, like all your organs and everything are like shifting back into place. And so like your colon, and, like your intestines and stuff are all shifting different. Like, right. So like, you know, that's got to normalize. Like, you're not going to have a bowel movement right away. Yeah. Some people, like, I don't know. They just get really nervous about it. Like, Oh, I was um, terrified. I was terrified yeah. to have my first bowel movement. Yeah. Well, some people get scared because they're not having one. Like, and it's been a day. And I'm like, it's yeah. okay, sweetheart. It's totally normal. So yeah. then I listen to heart sounds, um, bowel sounds, just to make sure everything is flowing. The Mm -hmm. most important thing about a mother infant assessment that is different than others is a fundal assessment. Yeah. You do a fundal assessment and that is to ensure the um, your uterus is contracting back to its normal state. Now, if it's boggy, like what what is the correlation between like a boggy uterus and then like 
hemorrhaging? Like, why does a boggy uterus cause more bleeding? So it could be leftover placental fragments or it could be you need to empty your bladder. A lot of times I'll like do a funnel assessment and mom is boggy. And I'm like, have you went to the bathroom recently? And they're like, no, I'm scared it's going to burn or, you know, just haven't felt like getting up or, you know, pain. Mm -hmm. A lot of times movement causes pain. So it's it's something that's scary. And then Mm -hmm. she'll empty her bladder like a liter almost. Okay. (laughs) And so then we'll we'll recheck a fundal or sometime it's actually that they may be hemorrhaging really, Mm. which I've experienced that as well, where it's like a clot that's in there and it needs to be expressed and you massage that fundus and hopefully you get that clot out. It's no joke. Fundal assessments are uncomfortable. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah. for sure. I I feel like in the labor and delivery room, they were like really uncomfortable. Yeah. yeah, and then in mother baby, all the nurses were like a little bit nicer about it. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh, you know, you, you got all your placenta out. That's. Fine. I think yeah. another thing about that, I get that all the time being on mother infant. Like, like you know, you're afraid as the patient, you're afraid to. Yeah. You like, are you going to press on my belly? And I'm like, yes, I am. Yeah. And they're like, oh no. And then you do it, and they're like, oh, they were so rough on L and D. And I try to <laughs> say like, not necessarily they were rough, but. You, it was right after delivery, so yeah. think about it. You are way more sensitive, and you have a higher chance of hemorrhaging during that period. Even though once yeah. you transfer to mother baby, it's only been about two hours, so you can still have that window of opportunity, but mm-hmm. that's when your chances are higher. And it's yeah. essentially they, just, they have the to. You know, it's yeah. not not anything like labor and delivery nurses are meaner. We it's want, just yeah, like, like they want to dig your be- dig in your belly, and make you <laughs> hurt. No, that's not the thing. So. <laughs> Yeah. Um. So then after my fundal assessment, of course, I'll do a long assessment of the posterior and anterior lungs and the front and the upper and lower lobes. Fundal assessment. If my mom has not, now, sometimes modesty can be a little rough. You once you go to the hospital, have a baby, you may realize you lose, it's all out the window. Like, yeah. <laughs> it's all out the window. But some people, it's still, even after even after le- leaving labor delivery, it's still hard for them to accept. Like, really? I've had patients like, hold on, I'm getting dressed. And I'm like, well, I'm going to be seeing, I mean, I'm going to be seeing everything anyway. So, but See, I try to just... still give my patients as much privacy as possible. But in some cases, yeah. that's hard. Like, because if they have a C-section, I want to examine the incision to make sure it's not bleeding excessively. Yeah. And stuff like that, especially, you know, C-section mamas or even my vaginal mamas, if they haven't gotten up, I want to I'll check them for bleeding myself. Because especially when you had a C-section, you can't do it yourself. Yeah. So I like that double reassurance. And then I think that there's a line that uh, like, a you know, that nurses have to cross when it comes to, you know, modesty. Like, you know, there's a like you have to check the incident like everything that we're doing like you know it's it may seem invasive to the patient but I think as long as you're like setting up that interaction right you know I feel like right it's something that we have to do we have to assess yeah as long as I still try sometimes it can get hard like to remember I also like if my moms are breastfeeding or even if they're not I look at their nipples yeah and see because some moms are like oh yeah breastfeeding is going great and you look at their nipples and they're broken down. Yeah. And it's not going great. Yeah. Right. I know that was another thing. It's like when you're breastfeeding, like, yeah, you just, it's a level of modesty that you probably are, people aren't just, not, the the lay person is not yeah. comfortable with. I don't know. I, I've been on the other side, it's like as a patient, like I know like <laughs> the, my modesty is going to go out the window. So like it didn't bother me because like, I, right. I know as a patient, like the nurses don't care, you know, we but, don't. like, and it's we just care. something that like it's, I need to learn. So like breastfeeding, you have to incorporate the nurse in that. And then, so after that, I'll go down to the lower extremities, just examine the legs mm-hmm. um, and their feet for swelling. A lot of times people are like, Oh my gosh, my feet are huge. What is this? And they may expect it to go down. Like, Immediately after having a baby, everybody has different expectations or some people just don't have that knowledge. So that's my job to educate them. So I'm like, you know, especially if they had a C-section or even a vaginal and they get plenty of fluids. I'm like, this Mm -hmm. is totally normal. Um, It should get better over the next couple of days. It may get worse before it gets better. 
Uh, yeah. Yeah, I didn't realize if you get an epidural, they want you to have at least a liter in before you get the epidural. Before. Yeah. So like, and then you might have, because your blood pressure drops when you get the, the epidural. So like, yeah, yeah you're, you can definitely be swollen. They put more, especially if you were, some women swell terribly throughout their pregnancy Mm-hmm. And some women don't at all. So imagine if you're putting that leader on top of somebody who's already swollen. Yeah. Um. So I always do the education. I would like tell my moms, even though you're getting, if they are getting IV fluids, still once they get to mother baby, uh, people are sometimes have that misconception that they really don't need to be drinking fluids by mouth. And I'm like, mm-hmm. even though you're getting these fluids, I still want you to be drinking water. I try to encourage water, but I'm like, whatever you want, yeah. you did, you did the thing. You just had a baby. So if you want water, if you want Pepsi, whatever you want, I encourage you to drink it. Um, And I just say the more you drink, the more fluids you will pull off. Yeah. When you empty your bladder. That's that must be kind of nice. Like, I don't know. I think about in med surge when all your patients want Pepsi and it's like you kind of feel responsible to be like, no, no. <laughs> but like in mother baby, it's kind of like, yeah, like whatever you want, you know, like whatever you're you only going to be here for like a couple of days. Like, you know, whatever just you take, want. this is the time. <laughs> this is the time you deserve it. So, so after I do my mom's and I do my assessments in this order for a reason. So I like to assess the mom, then the baby, because if I assess the baby and I get the baby upset, it's kind of hard to mm. get through my mom's assessment. Yeah. And the partner maybe resting and so if I assess mom first then assess the baby and the baby's upset I then have some time I'm done like I've done my assessments and then I can calm the baby down yeah um so then I after my mom's that's pretty much it about mom yeah heart sounds bowel sounds long sounds fundal assessment check my pulses and looking at the upper and lower extremities and talk about bleeding yeah it's it's really straightforward for the most Mm -hmm. part um, so then I look, listen to the baby. The babies at almost all hospitals, at all hospitals have security tags for safety reasons. Mm-hmm. I verify the numbers. Um, I listen to my baby's heart rate. Um, lung sounds, just like I do on mom, bowel sounds. I do, I palpate the anterior and posterior fontanelles on the baby's head, which should be soft, flat, and open. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes they're full, which may be, may be fine, or that may be indicating that something needs to be further investigated. I look at the baby's belly, make sure mm-hmm. it's not distended or anything. What about the fontanelles being full? Like, what could that indicate? Like hydrocephalus or something? It could. It could be fluid or something. Just something's going. It should. It's a wide variety. It's no like mm. set answer. Yeah. So we just like to like palpate them, and sometimes they have overriding sutures, which is normal, or molding. I just like to look at the structure of their head mm. and make sure everything looks normal. Especially if mom had to get some um, internal fetal monitoring, make sure the baby doesn't have any scratches on his or her head. Oh, okay. Or if they do, at least I'm aware. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Um, and then I always change my baby's diaper. I always look at my baby's diapers. So one mm-hmm. last thing for mom and dad to do, I already have them all out and open. So, of course, I give them a fresh diaper change. And then lastly, I definitely take their temperature last because... 99.9% of the time, it's going to make them very upset. Aww. And then if I do that first, then it's very hard for me to get their respiration. I also yeah. get their respiratory rate. And it's going to be extremely hard to do that. Yeah. So I get it last because I know that upsets them. And that's my and they don't get assessment. blood pressures on babies, right? No, we don't. Unless they have like a heart, a known heart issue going on. Sometimes the doctor may ask to get four point blood pressures. But I can almost count on my hand a number of times. Like, I've done a blood pressure on a baby. Yeah. Not often at all. Because I can't imagine them being accurate. You know, if you yeah. have, like, babies kicking, kicking and moving around. Yeah. No. And they're going to be agitated. It's going to go it, up. Like, It's so weird because I like to be transparent and upfront. I do float to the NICU sometimes, mm-hmm. and they do do blood pressures. And, yeah. of course, I'm a nurse. I'm competent within my specialty. But... If you're not used to, I'm like, so what is it? What's normal? What's not normal? Because I'm not used to doing them on mother infant. It's not yeah. like an, an adult. Of course, we both know an adult's normal range blood pressure. And mm-hmm. was obviously abnormal. But on the babies, I'm like, so what's 
Like, does this seem accurate? Yeah, right. They do them in the NICU, but we definitely don't on Mother Infant, unless per the MD's request. So you can float to NICU. Can you float to Mother Baby? I mean, labor and delivery, labor. too? So at different hospitals. Oh, okay. At one hospital I've been at, I've never, like, as a mother infant, we never, ever float to labor and delivery. Mm. Um, at the other facility, I float to labor and delivery and NICU. Um, mm. And it's kind of weird. It's a fine line. Thankfully, with me being a doula and, like, me loving all the things considering labor, yeah. I'm comfortable with that stuff. A lot sure. of mother infant nurses are not comfortable with the idea of having to catch a baby. Yeah. Like, postpartum... Sometimes people who aren't often in healthcare get labor and delivery and postpartum like mixed up or think it's the same thing because, however, at some hospitals, they do have the two where they're combined labor yeah. and delivery and um, recovery and postpartum. But it's two very different things. Mm. When I went to labor, it's very weird because I'm like thinking, okay, well, what am I going to be doing? I don't even know. Like a doula and a labor and delivery nurse, two totally sep- separate scopes of practice. Sure. And, a lot of people, like family, are like, well, aren't you a nurse? And people who are on in healthcare, some of them tend to think everything is our specialty. Orthopedics, <laughs> cardiac, wound care, everything, <laughs> yeah. you name it. They're like, you went to nursing school? And I'm like, yes. Like, we went over that for like a few weeks. Yeah, right. And... I saw a PowerPoint on that like two years ago. <laughs> yeah, no. Um, so I, when I went to labor and delivery, it was very weird because I had one patient. It was nice. Yeah. I have one patient, and I'm used to having What's the ratio? Six. So typically six, one to six. I've been to a facility where I've had eight, which was pretty rough. Wow. Um, a couplet, a mom and a baby is a couplet, and so that counts, you know, as two separate patients. Okay, okay. But sometimes you have NICU mamas as well or antepartum patients who mm-hmm. may be with you for a long time. And some people don't e- are not even aware that women get stuck in the hospital Um I probably shouldn't use that word stuck, but they, they get stuck in the hospital for maybe a month or two or more if they have high risk pregnancy complications mm-hmm. going on. Um, but I And have they'll be on patient. mother baby? They'll be it depends. It all depends on their situation, if how far dilated they are, if they're contracting or not. Okay. Sometimes they'll be on mother baby. We just have the standard to monitor them maybe sure. twice a day or three times a day for an hour. Okay. And you teach them about the signs of preterm labor. And at one facility I was at, in the rooms, you have a preterm labor kit in the room. So that in the mm-hmm. event they start going to labor, you know, you put on your sterile gloves and you hop up on their bed. Wow. And the nice thing about, it's, it's so different comparing different facilities, but at one facility, um, labor and delivery um, was two floors below and they would place those kind of patients like high risk patients near the elevators near the doors hmm. so that you can get rushed on down yeah but when I was to labor and delivery I had one patient she was in labor but one thing that was very hard for me that was different because see on mother infant we ha- monitor our patients but say we'll only monitor them for 30 minutes once you get a a good beetle tracing you'll take them off or hour and you take them off and then you don't have sure. to do it again or any year shift until night shift. Or if so, if a mom has twins, typically they monitor them more frequently. So you may have to monitor them for two hours throughout your 12 hour shift, which isn't much. But on labor mm-hmm. and delivery, moms typically are on continuous monitoring. Mm-hmm. So I had that one patient, but she was on continuous monitoring and her baby, you know, anytime the baby comes off the monitor, you got to go put that baby back. So it was a different experience for me, but I was only there for a few hours and I only like throughout my nursing career, I've been floated to labor delivery once. Mm. So not often. We'll be right back to our interview. Grab a cup of coffee, but don't go anywhere because we want to talk to you about our podcast partner, American Mobile. No matter your specialty, American Mobile has endless travel nursing opportunities. With the largest clinical team of all staffing agencies, American Mobile is ready to support you in achieving your career goals. To learn more about the benefits of American Mobile, like higher earning potential, premium health coverage, and 401k matching, make sure to visit AmericanMobile.com to speak with a recruiter. Again, visit AmericanMobile.com to discover your next travel nursing adventure. Now back to the show. 
Yeah, I was wondering as a so as a labor and delivery. I mean, I keep mixing up as a mother baby traveler. Uh huh. How does that work? Like, if you get a contract, uh, you know, does it say like, hey, we can float you to labor and delivery, or like, how does that? How yeah. Does that work? So it's so funny that you asked that. Um. So they have they had labor and delivery for me. I could float to labor and delivery or NICU. And because okay. as a traveler, the only downside, I wouldn't say downside, but it kind of is a downside because you you work within your specialty. So you want to work within your specialty. Yeah. Um, As a traveler at the most recent facility I was at, or I think that's a universal traveler thing. You're the first to float. So sure. it doesn't matter if yeah. you floated yesterday. Um, If you're a traveler, you get floated. And mm-hmm. so my two spots to go were labor and delivery and NICU. Okay. But then one day. I had an instance where, like, they were floating nurses to, like, cardiac units. And I had to, like, say, like, in a professional mannerism, as pos- as much as possible, I had to say, you know, I'm not willing to do this. I don't feel comfortable. Yeah. Like, like they... That's not in my scope. I haven't taken care of, like, cardiac Right. Patients. And it was like, mm-hmm. you would act... They said I would act as a nurse assist. And it was just weird because I didn't feel comfortable. So I was very strong and stern. And I was like, well... The only place I'm willing to go is labor delivery and NICU. And labor and delivery is still kind of a stretch for a lot of people. Yeah. Um, well, because it's a whole different nurse. specialty. It's a different assessment. Yeah. It's a different, like, w- when I think about that stuff, I think about the the uh, opportunity to not catch a small change because it's not in my ex- area of expertise. Right. You and know? it's scary because even oftentimes... It's nice from for people to kind of hear it from the different aspect who are not in healthcare, but it's kind of not nice. But it's kind of just being aware. So like going to the NICU if you have parents asking you questions, and of course yeah. we're we're always going to be a nurse. Nobody's going to ever take that away from yeah. us. But it's kind of like honestly, I'm not sure about that. And I kind of try to be full trans, like disclose full transparency. Like you know, this isn't my normal specialty. I'm not sure of the answer, but I will find out for you. Yeah, but it's I, it's weird. I feel bad for those family members and those patients, you know, when it's like you could have the next nurse that is like fully confident in, in this, Probably. but you have me. <laughs> right. So like, and I don't know anything about this. Yeah. And like, you don't want to say that, but like also, I mean, that's just kind of like the climate that we're in right now in the hospital is that like. You could be floated to wherever, and I think you're right in that having kind of setting that, having that conversation up front maybe with patients and family members, like this is, you know, or maybe saying like, I've been a nurse for like so long, you know, this is my, this is like where I'm confident. I'm just here for the day. If you have any like specialized questions about like, I'm more than happy to go find those answers for you, but just like, please be patient with me or, you know, something like that. I think that yeah. would probably go a long way. Yeah. Setting that relationship up up front rather than wait until the actual question is that's the key. Yeah. Because people respect you way more when you tell like when you're telling the truth. Yeah. That's just like if they asked me a question I didn't know, I wouldn't try to like halfway answer it. I'm gonna like, you know, tell them I don't know. Some right. some and some nurses have a hard time not knowing the answer to everything, but we will never yeah. know everything. So, which is fine. Right. Yeah, I th- absolutely. I think that's the way to go because you're going to develop, like the patient's not going to trust you if they, you know, sense that you don't actually know what's going on. Or if you just flat out say like, I don't know, this isn't my expertise. <laughs> right. Like, like you got to get like, do that one step further and just be honest and still be, like you said, everybody is a nurse at the end of the day. Like, you know how to maintain a, rapport with your patient to be like I don't know that answer but I can find it out for you yeah and sometimes it's nice because say I if I took care of a NICU mom and I get floated to the NICU I may like oh my gosh I get to see your baby and that happened to me which was kind of a very rewarding because of course like she was showing me pictures of her baby but I actually got to see her baby and see her and I hadn't seen her in a few months well not a few months like maybe a month or so so that was so nice oh wow it yeah. kind of like comes full circle. Yeah. Oh, that's nice. What are some of your 
in mother baby, what are some of your favorite patients to take care of and some of the most challenging you think? My favorite. I love, um, I actually love antepartum patients, Hmm. um, which are patients who have their stay in the hospital prior to having their baby. Yeah. They're pretty self-sufficient, but that's not the only reason. The main reason is because I like developing those relationships with my patients. And on mother infant, sometimes it's hard if, in comparison to maybe mad surge or so, because, you know, mad surge, you may have someone there for a long time. Yeah. Mother infant, typically, they may be there for 24 hours or they may be there for four days. Mm-hmm. And so you may get a patient where you really create a good trusting uh, relationship with and then they'll be gone the next day. Yeah. So I like those kind of patients, um, the antepartum patients. Mm-hmm. And then I also, you know, vaginal, the standard vaginal delivery, of course, is al- is always a little easier. Um, mm-hmm. Or experienced moms are easier sometimes. Yeah. And then I would say sure. the most challenging would be um, C-sections or mm-hmm. people who have experienced birth trauma, uh, a NICU mom. Because it's like you just went through all of this um, hardship. Your birth plan didn't go as your birth didn't go as planned. And then your baby isn't up here as well. Or um, teenage moms mm. or those or those with lack of support sure. are a little more challenging to care for. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. So those are kind of the harder ones. But it's no it's like a fine line because you may have a. You may have a C-section, for example, you may have a C-section mom. This is her first baby. She is 18 years old, and she does very well. Mm -hmm. She may be, like, feeding the baby, changing the baby on top of everything. So I kind of always go into things with a clear mindset, like, I'm not, like, oh, this this is going to be great. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, maybe, like, not not go in with, like, a preconceived notion that, like, they don't have it, you know. Right. Right. And everybody has different pain management. Yeah. I've had people, uh, you know, C-section moms have Foley's. We like to take the Foley out within 12 hours because, you know, evidence shows Foley's can increase the risk of infection. So we want to keep it in there as least as possible. Mm -hmm. Um, So you may, I've had a mom come up from labor delivery. She just had her baby three or four hours ago and she's like, when can I take a shower? And I'm like, hold on now. (laughs) Uh, We're going to get you situated first. And then you may have someone who is very different and is having some pain management issues and they've hit their 12 hour mark um, for their Foley to be pulled and they don't want to get up. Yeah. So it's different. It's different for different people. I can't imagine. I feel like that's got to be so sad to have a mom that like doesn't have support or like does, you know, something went wrong or like it's just the whole entire experience is like sad more so than like, you know, have like Happy. overjoyed. Yeah. Yeah. It's rough. And that's another like misconception about mother baby. Like people, sometimes people are like, you're a mother baby or they think some people don't have as much respect for mother baby nurses um, mm-hmm. as other specialties, which it sucks, but I I know what I do and I know it's important. And so that's where that um, confidence comes in. Yeah. But uh, another misconceived notion about mother baby mm-hmm. nurses is that it's always like, it's always happy. Yeah. Which is not always true. Um, right. You have moms who have, like, social issues. It can be hard, you know. Um, infants passing, which is really hard. I have only experienced that um, once within my career so far, mm-hmm. which is which is really rough. Um, all nurses deal with stuff differently. Yeah. Some can, like, not be bothered by it or hide it and... I can be bothered by it, but, you know, still remain that professionalism. So it's not always easy. And we we get short staffed just like other places in the hospital. And then we get help, too. Like, like just how we go to the NICU, we get help as well. And it's hard sometimes because, say, if we get a float nurse or a peas nurse and a mom is having a difficult time breastfeeding, a pediatric nurse, unless, like, from her yeah. own experience, typically cannot help a mom with breastfeeding. Right. So, right. I was going to say something about the, oh, in those instances where something is really hard and difficult, you know, it's okay to like show that you're human too. Yeah, it's it's definitely. I think that that goes a long way too. I mean, 
it's so easy, at least in the ICU as, as an ICU nurse, like it's almost easier to kind of like focus on like the nursing aspect of stuff instead of like allow yourself to get to that place and like be hurting with that other person. But like, it does go a lot, protect your heart, you know, like right. these, this is a hard job to do. Like, it's hard to like see that, you know, it doesn't matter like whatever specialty you're in, but like, if you can show that kind of like human connection, like it, it, it goes a long way. And I think it's almost like healing for us too. Cause like a lot of times I think when I see something in the ICU, like my patient dies or like somebody coded or something and I just shield it off. Like, yeah, I'm going to bottle it for another day later. Whereas like, if I were to just like show that a little bit of that emotion or like be there for family in like a more human way, I think that that probably helps my like psyche too. In yeah. A way. Totally. I agree. You probably, as you being an ICU nurse, you have probably experienced more um, death deaths than I have. Um, sure, I've I've had a adult pet like two before, so I can't imagine how how that is to yeah. have to deal with that. And it's kind of like you can be. I feel like as a nurse, you can be the boss in a textbook. You learn a lot of textbooksy things, but then when you actually get into the real world, you kind of learn how you are. Like in my situation. Um, it was rough for me seeing that. Um, and I could tell it was rough for the mom, but I still had to provide her with care. Yeah. So it's like it's kind of it's kind of strange because I'm going in there asking her, does she need this or that? And she has her baby right here who has descended. So it's sad. So I'm like, it's like tearing me up and I could tell it's tearing her up and I'm trying to like just be normal, but it's like hard. So I, yeah. I offered, I said, Would you like a hug? And she said yes. And I just hugged her. Yeah. And and then that you probably also, went a long way. Yeah, I hugged her for a while. And then this one gets a little t- the next thing I did gets a little touchy, but it's at your discretion and you kinda have to have a feel for the patient. Now everyone is religious and, and you know, you yeah. have to provide holistic care and sometimes you have to be very careful when you get into that. But I asked her, Does she, does she pray? And she said, yeah. And I asked her, did she want to pray together? So we prayed together. That's really sweet. Yeah. I, when I was, um, when I was traveling, I went to an, um, religious based hospital once for my assignments and I'm oh. not particularly religious, but I felt like I learned how to pray uh-huh. with people like in that assignment. And I took that with me like, you know, later on, because it's like, oh. and I almost like used it kind of as a, like, if that's something that they value, like, it, that's part of their culture, you know, it's like, that could be a therapeutic thing. Like, if, if I'm okay with that, and like, I've, I've offered that to patients before. And like, and there was, I remember there was one patient that he was so grateful that we did that. Aww. And like, you know, it was just so it's, I think it's totally fine to like kind of get a feel of what your patient could benefit from. And then, you know, right. It's the little things like literally it meant it had some um, sentimental meaning towards me, but I'm sure that that meant a lot, way more a lot to her than it meant to me. Yeah, absolutely. Like she'll remember you, you know, like you're part of that. That's like the most powerful, one of the most powerful things about, you know, we're inserting ourselves in the worst times of people's lives sometimes. And like, you know, we won't remember those patients, but like, they'll remember us. They'll remember our face and like what, what went on and, and how yeah. you like, that's, that carries a lot of weight, you know? Yeah, definitely. And not everybody, you know, not everybody that's having a baby wants a baby. Yeah. So it may be happy, you know, for me to see a baby, but you still have to provide them with that support or they may not have a support person within their life. Mm-hmm. So th- having a baby already with a husband, a, a grandmother, a grandfather with the whole support system is hard. Yes. So I can't imagine having nobody. not having. Yeah. You see. Some and in that stuff. point, you would probably is there like would case management get involved or like is there. Yeah. Any resources? So if they have a. 
So all moms do, this is like another part of my assessment. Um, all moms do a uh, EPDS, which stands for Ed- Edinburgh Postpartum Depression Skill. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so we give them to all moms. I always tell my mom, please fill this out. Typically, maybe not the first day. I always like try to let them like simmer down. You're tired and I don't want to feel like I'm pushing something on them. Mm-hmm. But I tell them to please fill it out and it gauges how you've been feeling the past seven days. So not just today. But over the past seven days, and I always tell them, I just ask them to be as honest as possible. So depending on their scoring of that, we automatically have to consult social work. Mm. Or for teenagers, we automatically consult social work or anyone who has any like domestic abuse history, sexual abuse history. Some of those automatically like um, score in to get a consult. Okay. Oh, okay. So. And, or yeah. if a mom, even if a mom scores good and she says something that's concerning, I'll like reevaluate mm-hmm. and give her that resource. Sure. Because I would hate for a mom, you know, to leave and we didn't address one of her concerns or she like tried to reach out for help and nobody really uh, picked up what she was saying. Sure. And th- and that's another thing in my, um, I'm jumping around a little bit here, but in my discharge teaching, mm-hmm. Every patient I discharge, I always try to remember um, to talk about postpartum depression. Yeah. And I tell them that some moms don't experience it at all. Some moms experience it mildly and some moms experience it very severely. Mm -hmm. Um, I tell them it's nothing to be ashamed of because when you think about it, mental health, some people, it can be embarrassing. Mm -hmm. Um, So I tell them, you know, don't be embarrassed. You want to get help. You don't want to wait until it's too late to get help. Yeah, and it could be a, it could be an uncomfortable topic, but I rather talk about it with them, and so that say if they have a moment, they're like, okay, the nurse told me it's okay. You know, they, that might save someone's life. Yeah, and then I always ask, do you have a good support system at home? And they'll tell me yes. My husband, my friend, my sister, my mom, whoever, and I'm like, okay, will you let them know if you feel like you're getting overwhelmed? Yeah, and you need and you need some help. I think that's. I mean, that's a big, big. Um, part of it like it sneaks up on you I mean like right. as a like I think I've been really fortunate that I I've I didn't really get the baby blues but okay. I also like and and I filled out that EPDS you know thing like like literally every time you go to the doctor, doctor. afterwards like they mm-hmm. have you fill out this thing out and I just thought of it the other day like you know every time I go there I like fill it out like yeah I'm fine I'm fine I'm fine I'm fine I'm fine like check off all the things and then like I was like, oh, I mean, I did have a bad day the other day, you know, like I, yeah. like in my head later, I'm like, you know what, maybe I should actually like read into these questions. The boxes, like, yeah. It's, it's hard to, it does like, it's, it's a completely life changing thing, you know, and it's not easy. I can't, I can't imagine what it's like for people that don't have support. I would be in such a different place. I think if it wasn't for my support systems. And so it's, I mean, it's great that you set those conversations up. Like you really have to like hammer it in, in the hospital, like just check in with yourself and like, keep, keep yourself aware of, yes. of what's going on. Cause it can sneak up on you. Yes, definitely. Mm-hmm. How do you think working in mother baby has changed the way that you might want to deliver future babies? You want kids? Yes. Yeah. Yes. I definitely want kids. So it's so funny because I love working in the hospital. Um, I love my job. Working in the hospital, I have gained a lot of knowledge and I still have plenty to learn. I do not desire to have my baby in the hospital. That's okay. my goal. Oh, well, yeah, I should have yeah, said being goal. a doula. Yeah. yeah. But um, you just learn so much. There's still some stuff that I still don't know about. But like from the labor and delivery aspect about certain medications, it's like I'm learning every day so that like I'm a doula as well. And I have a client, so I'm learning for myself and I'm learning for my client. Yeah. So his like changed, it's changed some feelings about, you know, like certain meds. And I try to like tread lightly because sometimes people take stuff and run with it. But it's it's like education we still need to learn. But I definitely want to have like a home birth or a birth to center birth like less stimulated and it's so yeah. funny because anytime I talk about it at work my coworkers immediately they say it's dumb <laughs> like they're like it's so dumb why would you want to do that and I have to explain to them and I also have to remember working in the hospital 
when you hear about home births or birthing center births, you don't hear, they don't send out a newsletter at the hospital saying, oh, we had a successful home birth or birthing <laughs> center birth. You see the gone bad aspect yeah. of it. Yeah, yeah. But I always, um, I always tell myself, you know, your body can do a lot of things and yeah, you have to come. A home births are not for everyone. Birth and center births mm-hmm. are not for everyone. Um, and you can still have just this beautiful experience at the hospital. Yeah. Um, you make your experience. Um, but I'm like, I think I definitely would want that. And I'm like, you can hemorrhage at home. Yeah. Just like you can at the hospital. But I think sometimes people have the misconception that it's like, it's just someone, I don't know sitting there with you like I don't know I think people think it's a misconception of like midwives and doulas like it's someone that's non-educated they yeah. still have the knowledge they can still give you know some of the hemorrhage medications mm-hmm. and stuff like that so that's a huge huge misconception yeah um within the hospital population I felt that last year too like when I was ta- I I never envisioned myself having a home birth but I think after I did it I was like Maybe oh, I can do this. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. Like, I don't know. I mean, I I had a great birth and like the hospital I was at, I I will go to again. Like I used midwives and like I loved my experience there. But I can see how if I didn't have a good experience, how it would maybe propel me to want to like pursue a home birth or a birth center. Like it's it's a completely different philosophy, I think. And like in the hospital there's a lot of like, you know, no stone goes unturned. Like they want to like look at everything X, Y, and Z, get labs, all that. There's a lot of interventions. Yeah. In and limitations, limitations yeah. as well. Yeah. And um, whereas like tensions. you have more control, I think, in a home birth and like a birth yeah. center. And they focus more on, I think, mom empowerment and like your ability to do this with a clinical you know, aspect of having like certified nurse midwives and definitely, and definitely. That. Um, and not everybody is a good candidate for a home birth or yeah. birth and center birth, especially yeah. like, you know, high risk pregnancies and such. But it's like I'm constantly learning about stuff like it's stuff that we do in the hospital, um, mm-hmm. that, you know, they don't do they don't do in the birth and center. Mm-hmm. Like you're not on you're not on a continuous monitor at a birth and center nine times out of ten. Yeah. You may get uh, frequent Doppler checks, but it's just a totally different nature of sure. things. Um, you yeah. might you might not even have an IV. <laughs> right. And I think that's probably that's scary for a lot of people, you know, to to be like, my, I, I don't know what's going on in there. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> that's know? scary. But for Before some, you know, it's it's like you have all the things tools that you need you have the medical professionals there to see if a baby's heart rate is decelerating during a contraction or you know like there's ways they're not just winging it and like hoping for the best like they're yeah. there is a they're knowledgeable you know. yes right right and then a, a touchy thing i'm not gonna get into that one too much but it's so funny like seeing the different kinds of like experienced doulas or mm-hmm. experienced nurse practitioners or midwives um in the hospital you know they tell you you can't eat mm. at birthing centers um or home births typically they encourage you to eat mm. which yeah. gets weird <laughs> i think like the nurse in me um it gets weird because people have the argument with where it's like, who that's a tough one. Um, if you haven't ate over, in over 12 hours, how are you going to have the energy to want to push your baby out? Yeah. You don't have any protein in you. However, you know, we all know um, as aspiring nurses, um, nurses, nursing students, that when you eat and if you have if you need surgery that increases yeah. the risk of aspiration so it it gets touchy because it's people yeah. who've had way more experience than me and that's the model that they go by yeah but see I, I just feel like i don't feel comfortable telling somebody to eat i don't know yeah it's so touchy i see where they're sure. coming from but it's it's different it's a different world it's an interesting position for you to be in because you're in this kind of middle, you're in this like juxtaposition in between like, you're I'm like, I'm a mother baby nurse that doesn't want hospital care when I go, when I right. have my own babies. 
Right. So it's just it's funny seeing yeah. the different kind of things, learning about the different kind of medications. Um, I just still I literally never stop learning. So I have so much more knowledge to gain when it comes to that. Yeah. Learning about like Pitocin and stuff. It's interesting. Mm hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I want to also, I want to leave a little bit of time to talk about IV bar, your experience in IV bar nursing, because I just think that that's a really cool, like extra additional job. Um, so tell me a little bit about your experience in, in like what IV bar, working in an IV bar is like. Yes, I love it. Um, this is a little different than a hospital, so I can speak on it. Mm -hmm. Um, I work at a pure essence medical spa in Carytown in Richmond, Virginia. Um, and it has been wonderful. It's kind of, that was my very first job as a nurse. So oh, okay. be before mother infant, um, my manager, you know, I was a newer nurse. She had faith in me. It's very different than the hospital. Mm -hmm. Um, but the thing that got me that job was at, when I was a CNA, I had lots of experience doing IVs and blood draws. Mm -hmm. So I was comfortable. So I started working there. It's very different because, you know, at the hospital, you may have six. Well, mother infant, I may have like seven other coworkers because, you know, we have higher ratios. I'm sure the ICU mm -hmm. is way high, way more coworkers, but it's literally just me by myself. Yeah. So you have wow. to have um, that confidence. But I actually love it. It's like a sense of peace that's very different from the hospital. Um, I would mm -hmm. have no more than two, three people at a time. Typically two people. Okay. Um, and these people are not sick, right. essentially. I mean, they may have a hangover <laughs> <laughs> or maybe lacking um, hydration um, or even some moms for hyperemesis if approved by their mm. doctor. People forget, you know, people often think IV and immediately think hospital. You don't have to go to the hospital and get IV. Mm. Um, it's It can get pretty pricey, but... It's worth the experience. It's way yeah. more popular in like Cali and stuff mm. than in Richmond. I don't think there are much um, IV place bar places here, but um, I love it. Um, we accept like PayFlex, so like some people have spending flexible spending accounts through their jobs, mm. and we do accept that. Um, we don't like take insurance, so I okay. may have I may have eight IVs in one day. I may have two. Um, it's a little different because most of the time in the hospital, you know, like if you're scheduled to work seven to seven, eight times out of 10, you're going to be there seven to seven. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes with the IV bar, that's not always the case. It's literally a huge change from the hospital. So like a day in the mm -hmm. life of me being an IV bar nurse. So I'll come in, I'll turn Alexa on, some like relaxing spa music. So like when people come in, they can block out. Or at least I can try to help them block out whatever um, is going on in their life that may be negative. And I also light a candle. So yeah. you can't be lighting candles in the hospital. <laughs> <laughs> That's so true. it's very different. Um, I look at my schedule. We have different packages. So we do we do um, IVs, which take 45 minutes to an hour. We also do quick shots. So like a fat burner, vitamin B12, vitamin D mm. injections, and immune boosting injections. Um, we also offer uh, other services. Is it services. kind of like an a la carte thing? Like people can just pick and choose or is there like a medical person saying like you should get this? No. So people kind of pick and choose. We have a doctor that oversees us like for our orders. So it's not like, you know, just nurse dependent. But I'm just I'm the only one there at that time. Okay. Um, And they come in, they tell me what they may be experiencing. And so like if they fatigue, have a headache, um, if they drunk a lot the previous night I may recommend the hangover ones towards them or if they're like I'm going out of town I just make sure I need I need to make sure I don't get sick we have an immune boosting one so just mm. based on and then some people um we have memberships so some people come every month or every two months and they already know what they want they may some just literally get a bag of fluids because their baseline is for them to be dehydrated um mm, okay and so yeah what's like those. the normal patient population like you said like hungover emesis gravita yeah or people who just need that extra hydration they are, are always dehydrated no no matter how much they drink okay um typically i see a lot of younger a lot of younger we have we serve like a mild range mm. i've had older patients i've had younger patients um 
And I've, I've had, well, I've, I don't really use the word patient. I say client because it's different. Yeah. Um. And so some people know what they want or they need some help. Some people already know what they want. They know what add-ons they want to select because we have different vitamins, glutathione, vitamin B12, uh, vitamin C, mm-hmm. iron, uh, folic acid. So we have a wide variety. Okay. Katorlac. Yeah. Right. Um, and then we also offer uh, foot detoxes, uh, yoni steams, and laser hair removal. Mm. But most of most of my services include IV. We also do mobile. Um, so I go to wow. people's homes and offer IV services as well. You know, you just have the little pole set up. It's hung by gravity, and you just do you get know them what they want before. You go? Yeah, typically I like to see what they want before they go so I can know what vitamins to pack, you know, for refrigeration purposes. Mm-hmm. Um, sure. Do you have to mix I'll... the bags? No, no, no. Well, hold on. Yes, you do. No kidding. Um, so you either have a liter of normal saline or you can do a half a liter. A liter of normal saline or um, LR. Mm-hmm. And then we have like certain formula sheets to go by that is made um that our doctor gives to us that oversees the practice. Okay. Um and I do like draw them up and put them in the bag. But it's not hard. It's that's different from the hospital too. But it's it's easy. Okay. I I literally love it. It's so different. Um it is also like full transparency, it's a service industry. So mm-hmm. we get to accept tips. Because oh, yeah. if someone was like in dire need, they will be going to the hospital. Sure. So it's kind of like a preferred, like it's something that they want. Yeah. So it's nice because it has given me a lot of confidence. Like I feel great about like sticking people. If a coworker needs help, I'm I'm never because yeah. repetition, and then see if I have a failed attempt. I have no one else to, which can be scary for a lot of people. But I have no one else to go to and then we yeah. also don't stick people like in the hospital you know it's imperative that you get labs if i can't stick you on the second time it's a stretch potentially a third time but we, typically we don't stick our patients three times our clients three times mm-hmm. because like i said we're, in, we're they're not in dire need and we don't want to create that negative like connotation with the spa sure. so then if if they can't but you're the only one in there so like i'm if the they, only one in there if they can't get stuck then Will they just like try to come? That's kind of like the downfall. Yeah, they'll have to come back. Now, some okay. some will ask to be um, like, can you try again? I'm like, yeah, that's it though. And the big education piece behind that is some people are like, I drink water before I came in, and because you know what they are, they're coming in to get hydrated. So yeah. some people are harder. You know, um, mm-hmm. we keep heat packs, which can be imperative in trying sure. to get a good IV. Um, to get that vein to come up like you want it. And some people, you know, they're fine with that and they'll come back. And I always do the education because a lot of people have the misconception. I just drink a bottle of water before I came in here. And I'm like, you need to be hydrated between 24 and 48 hours before coming just to help. Yeah. And you may do, and I say you may do that and it may still be a difficult time. Like we have certain people who I know, like literally no matter how much they drink your heart st- their heart stick mm-hmm. but it has helped my skill tremendously because as a traveler i've been to other facilities where it's nice because they're like if your patient iv um infiltrates they're like oh just call the iv team which <laughs> sounds really nice but um sometimes you lose your skills yeah you lose your skill a lot of their nurses you know don't really know how to they don't feel confident in starting an iv Mm-hmm. So I just love that I developed that skill. It's, I mean, it it can get crazy. Like if I have a client, it's like I'm finishing up one client, another is coming in. But realistically, is nothing in comparison to the hospital. So it's like yeah. really, really nice. Yeah, I'm sure it's a nice like kind of balance to have, like working it's, something that's kind of like lower stress versus it's like a, a really good balance. Yeah. And then, like, you know, I don't have to work a full 12 hours. Yeah. It's nice. It's nice. Are you there? Like, what? how does the pay work? Does it work based on, like, your appointments? Or does it work, like, you have to be there for, like, a certain amount of time? Like, no. are they all, wa- like, are they walk-ins, too, or just appointments? So, we have some walk-ins, but a lot of people make appointments. It's funny, because, like, I get notifications on my phone now, like, when people book appointments. <laughs> and people have been booking. Um, But I still get paid an hourly rate. Okay. Um. 
And I mean, of course, I won't say numbers, but it's so funny because it, it's close to the hospital. It's still more than a hospital. Oh, my gosh. It's so it's kind of funny. <laughs> yeah, but I, like, I, mean, I still love my I, I love my babies. Um, And then when yeah. you think about it, you know, tips. It's not a ch- is yeah right. the services range like the depending on what you want for if you want like an IV hydration starts at around two hundred dollars and some people tip mm. fifteen but some people tip fifteen to twenty percent oh yeah um it's just it's just like a double it's kind of like a dream job a little yeah. bit because I'm like getting my skill in and it's not stressful at all yeah like maybe one day I'll gravitate um towards doing that like full time I don't know it's so different that's the good thing about nurses nursing you have a wide variety to choose from like you can do case management nursing yeah some nurses work from home which I think I like, maybe like that um so it's yeah. just nice it's nice to have a fine like a change yeah absolutely I know that's another I would love to have a case manager on to talk about case management and like what it's that yeah. entails too. Yes. But that's why we have podcasts, man. It's just there's so many things we can do with this I license. Know. I love it. I can't wait to tune in to some of the other ones, yeah. like hearing about some other nurses. Well, but it's. I think this is. I think this is a good place to end it. We had a great conversation about mother baby. We talked a little bit about Ivy Bar. So where can people find you? Um, I know that you have a budding business of Mary's Little Lambs. Yes, so Mary's Little Lambs you? is where I provide my birthing doula services and sometimes postpartum as well. I am only on Instagram right now looking to potentially expand my platform, but they can find me at Mary's Little underscore underscore lambs on Instagram. Awesome. And we'll plug that in um, with the episode too. So yes. you guys check it out. And then I also have a collective, which I'll give to Maggie to plug in, where it's called the Diverse Birth Collective. And it's a group amongst me and some other doulas. So say if someone is looking to hire me and I may not be available, I can always lead them in the direction to have that support. Oh, amazing. Yeah. I love that. Well, Gabby, thank you so much for coming on today. It was great talking to you. Yes. Thanks for having me. This was great. That brings us to the end of the show. Thanks for tuning in to Nursing Uncharted. To learn more about today's episode, make sure to explore the show notes at AmericanMobile.com slash Nursing Uncharted. And don't forget to subscribe so you never miss a guest. If you're a nurse interested in traveling, visit AmericanMobile.com to explore the largest database of travel nursing jobs in the industry and the amazing benefits that American Mobile has to offer. Also, a special thanks to producer Jonathan Carey, assistant producers Katie Schrauben and Sam McKay, and Aiden Dykes for the music and editing. Until next time, take care of yourself.